Are you looking for a small SUV slash large hatchback that's stylish and fun to drive? How about a more practical alternative to the popular Kia Seed hatchback? Hi there, I'm Tom from OSV. This is the latest version of the Kia X-Seed and in today's review, we're gonna discover if this is exactly what you've been searching for in the family segment. The Kia Exceed launched in the UK in 2019 and has since undergone a mid-life facelift and that's the model we're going to be reviewing for you today. Kia has positioned this car in the very competitive and rather confusing small SUV crossover segment. Um, it's essentially a larger and more practical version than the regular Seed hatchback and it faces tough competition from not only popular hatchback offerings like the Ford Focus and the VW Golf and the Mazda 3, but also small SUVs like the Volkswagen T-Roc and the Skoda Karoq. It also faces competition from within as this car slots between the Stonic and the Nero in the Korean brand's lineup. And if you want even more practicality, you can even opt for the Sportage, which recently underwent a new generation. So why, if you're looking for your next family car, should you consider the Exceed over its rivals and its siblings? We're going to find out today, guys. Let's start by examining the exterior design, but before we do, head over to the OSV website to browse the latest offers on the Exceed. And if you like cars, specifically in-depth, comprehensive reviews of them, subscribe to the channel. The Exceed's design is a blend of modern hatchback and SUV crossover stylings with those prominent wheel arches, chunky bumpers, and the bulky tailgate. And altogether, that creates a look that's rather distinctive and, well, just fun when compared to other rivals in its segment. Love the new Kia logo, displayed prominently here on the bumper, much better than that old boring design. Also really like the LED headlights that come as standard and the design of these. Love this bit here, not too sure how to describe that, but it gives a lot of personality to this car. You get a high gloss black radiator grille as standard, one at the top here and one just on the, uh, on the bumper there, complemented by satin chrome inserts. So there's quite a lot going on with this front bumper, but it doesn't feel cluttered, it's all quite organised, gives the car a very aggressive and sporty look. Heading round to the side is where we get a better look at the coupe-like lines and the jacked up suspension when compared to the regular seed. This car is 85 millimetres longer than its sibling, coming in at 4,395 millimetres. Though saying that, the wheelbase hasn't been extended at all, so this larger car doesn't provide additional passenger space inside, but there is more boot space to work with, and we'll open that up in just a sec. The body colour we've chosen is Lunar Silver, and that's one of the premium options available with the entry level two model, and that's the car we're gonna be testing out for you today. There's a bunch of other premium colours available as well, especially as you start climbing up those different specifications to the higher grade models. So if you wanna dive into those in a bit more detail, get in touch with one of OSV's vehicle experts. You get 16 inch alloy wheels with the entry level two trim and the free plug-in hybrid variant. And I like that Kia hasn't skimped out on the design of these. They actually look quite nice for an entry level model. You can upgrade to larger 18 inch alloys with those higher spec grades as well. These lovely door mirrors are electrically adjustable from inside the cabin and they're heated, perfect for those cold winter mornings. And if you opt for any variant that isn't the two specification, they're also folding, so they're folding inwards when you lock the car. The door handles are gonna be splattered in the body color you've chosen. You also get roof rails as standard, and if we head towards the back, you'll spot the fuel cap, and it's rather large, isn't it? There's a reason for that. The Kia Exceed is also available as a plug-in hybrid model, and Kia just didn't bother to change the size of it. But that's fine, I guess that's somewhere they didn't want to cut costs, and I understand that. But one major issue is that it doesn't shut properly. So as you can see, I've got it closed, but I could just put my fingers under there, 
and pry it open. So that's a bit concerning considering the current fuel crisis. I like the design of the Exceed's rear. It's rather bulbous and rotund. The rear spoiler, of course, you'll see this on pretty much every new car that comes out now. Uh, the rear lights, I like how they strut out from the side. And of course, we have the Kia badging in the center there, completing the look, plus those fake exhausts. i normally bash that they're fake, but yeah, I think they just add to the overall styling and it's a very good looking car. Right, I think it's about time we open up the boot then to see how much more space is offered over the regular seed. Let's find out. As you just saw, I had to use a bit of the old elbow grease to get that boot open and that's because a power operator tailgate is locked behind those higher spec trim levels so you may want to take that into account. But the boot space, much larger than what you get with the regular seed. In fact, it's up 31 litres to 426 litres. That's more than rivals like the Focus, that gives you 375 litres, and the VW Golf's 380 litres, so it beats out the competition in this regard. But that's just with the petrol model. If you opt for the plug-in hybrid, you get a significantly reduced boot space all the way down to 291 litres and that's a result of those bulky batteries under the floor of the boot. Quite disappointing, plus you don't get the height adjustable boot floor that I absolutely love. The adjustable floor helps to reduce the intensity of that loading lip when lugging those heavy shopping bags into the back and if we peel it up it reveals quite a generous amount of underfloor storage. It's not the prettiest in the world, but it's perfect for lobbing your umbrella and other bits and bobs that you like to keep out the way and to not compromise the rest of the boot space. So how many suitcases can you fit in the back then? Well, we reckon you can fit four, that was an excellent throw by the way, four of these small carry-on luggage into the back here, five if you stack them, so that's pretty good there compared to its rivals. On either side, we've got small storage compartments, perfect for those objects that like to roll around on the go. We've got a 12 volt socket as well, next to a hook to attach those objects down, and there's hooks as well on the adjustable floor itself. So yeah, very impressed with the level of practicality on offer for the boot space, and it does outperform its rivals in this regard. Well, in the hatchback segment anyway. If you need more boot space for a cycling trip or an overzealous family holiday, you can fold down that rear bench. As standard, it folds in a 60-40 arrangement, though if you want that middle seat to fold down independently so you can slide objects through into the rear cabin, you can get a 40-20-40 configuration with the higher spec grades. It's a bit of a faff trying to fold them down from the back here due to the bulky parcel shelf, so I'm just going to head around to the back here. The lever to fold them down is just at the top of the seats and they come down quite naturally. Uh, they're not spring loaded so do be careful with that. When the seats are fully folded you get 1378 litres of space in total and with the plug-in hybrid option this reduces to around 1240 litres. And as you can see guys that height adjustable boot floor is going to be perfect for those trips to the tip you're not going to have any objects falling down any awkward gap because there isn't one it's pretty flush all the way into the cabin there great level of practicality on offer with the exceed so guys if you're impressed with the level of practicality on offer with the exceed and you think it can work for you you want to start exploring those pricing options then get in touch with osv's vehicle experts on 01903 538 835 or you can just click that pop-up banner up there to book a date or time for a quick chat. It looks like the weather's going to take a turn for the worst though, as is often the case in the UK. So let's hop in the front and take the XC for a spin. Right then guys, with the Kia Exceed you have a choice of three different powertrains, two petrol and one petrol plug-in hybrid unit. Unfortunately, diesel is no longer available with the Exceed range here in the UK. If this is important to you and you're somebody who travels quite a lot um, every single day, then you're going to have to look more towards the regular seed and that 1.6 litre CRDI variant, which is still available at the time of recording, or perhaps even the larger uh, Kia Sportage if you're happy with going with a vehicle of that form factor and body style. 
The model we have here is the entry level variant. So we've got the entry level trim and the entry level petrol engine. That's a one litre turbocharged petrol. It's the TGDI variant. It outputs 180 brake horsepower for a 0 to 62 time of 11.1 seconds. They are pretty average for a small SUV. As standard, the Xceed is configured with six speed manual, but you can go with um, automatic. That is an option if you want to go for that. I quite like this gearbox. It's firm and it gives a nice bit of feedback as you glide through the gears, though it is a bit sluggish, perhaps too sluggish off the block. You really have to make the car rev to get any kind of momentum, say up to 30 miles an hour. And that means you're gonna have to judge those gaps in the traffic a lot more carefully than you would with a nippier city car or even the regular seed. Once you're up to speed though, say above 30 miles an hour, I'm surprised by how nicely the Xceed cruises along. It's very comfortable inside the cabin here, and when you need to put your foot down to overtake some slow moving traffic, it has a surprising amount of give in this regard. Uh, in terms of fuel economy then, Kia claims a figure of 47.1 mpg on the combined cycle. That's not what we're achieving though, unfortunately. The trip is saying that we're averaging 41.4 um, quite a bit lower than that claimed figure, but of course this does depend on a variety of conditions such as, you know, the rain and where you're driving and the kind of driving that you're doing. If you want something with a bit more welly, then consider the more powerful 1.5 litre petrol unit. It's the better option for driving around town, it's much nippier, you can get into those tight gaps in traffic and you just don't need to rev it as much to get up to speed. What are the pedals like? Well, the accelerator pedal is nice and firm and it gives you a nice bit of resistance as well so you know exactly how much gas you need to give the car to get off the block. The clutch on the other hand is rather springy, perhaps too springy. I would like this to be much firmer. If you're very conscious about the amount of CO2 you're pumping out of the car and if zero emissions range is important to you then you can also consider that plug-in hybrid petrol option. This is powered by a 1.6 litre petrol unit paired with an 8.9 kilowatt hour battery pack and a 59 brake horsepower electric motor. A performance is very similar to this entry level petrol option. Uh, running entirely off the battery, you can achieve an electric range of up to 36 miles. Not bad, though when compared with other plug-in hybrid petrol options out there, it does pale in comparison. And that's where a major problem with the Xceed lies. Because it's targeting both hatchback and small SUV consumers, there's going to be places where the rivals just beat this car out, and that's certainly the case with the all-electric range here. But it is quite a good company car option. Uh, it sits in the 12% benefit in kind band for 2022 to 2023. Not as good as say what you'd get with the Kia uh, EV6 or the e Nero, which of course are fully electric and they're placed in the 2% band for that period. Though, yeah, you can benefit from some pretty decent tax savings if you're a business user. What's the suspension like then? Well, it's been slightly tweaked over the regular seed. It's softer and it's got smarter dampers and that's aimed to provide a more pleasurable ride both around town and on the motorway. And indeed, you know, on these uh, undulating B roads, it does a great job at smoothing out any humps and bumps. And it especially excels when you're up to speed on the motorway, cruising along, it's surprisingly comfortable. Though I will say it's not as refined as something like a Toyota Corolla or VW Golf, but for the majority of families it's going to be more than suitable. It's also worth noting guys that suspension has been raised by 44 millimeters over this car's predecessor making it a more capable off-roader in some instances though don't expect to go trekking off into the Ganges with your new Xceed. Uh, the elevated ride height is mainly to just serve to reinforce that more sporty appearance over the seed um, but this should help when trying to get out of your driveway on a particularly wet and muddy and horrible day like today and you know trekking off into the countryside for a nice walk but it is an all-wheel drive so you won't get as much traction control as you would with some of this car's rivals. Handling is where this car falls short from one of its key rivals, the Ford Focus. It's just not as dynamic and agile as that car, making the driving experience here feel a lot less dynamic. There's also noticeably more body lean than with the regular seed. Um, this is especially noticeable when going around a tight corner or bend. These body cushions here do an okay job at holding you in place, but you often find yourself kind of over here in the corner on those more aggressive 
bend, so that's worth bearing in mind. Though this is an excellent car for driving around town due to the excellent turning circle and incredibly light steering. I'm just going to demonstrate that now as we turn into this junction. The steering is so easy, but it's very precise and responsive as well. And if we go around this bend as well, Great turning circle straight into the lane that I want to be in. What about noise then? Well, this one litre petrol engine is rather rowdy, especially at those lower speeds, as you can hear, revving quite a bit to get up to speed. But I quite like that, actually. It gives the car a fair bit of personality. If you want a more hushed ride, go with the plug-in hybrid option, especially when you're running off that battery pack. It's pretty quiet inside the cabin, and it consistently switches between the battery and the engine to provide a consistently hushed and quiet ride. So if that's a priority for you, go with that model. Uh, wind noise, I've hardly noticed this. Hardly notice any bellowing coming around the mirrors or pillars or windscreen. Um, noticeably better than some of its rivals then, especially the Focus and the Golf. Though when you're above, say, 60 miles per hour on a motorway or A road, you're going to start to hear some road noise seep into the cabin, though I've got to say it isn't much better um, in some of this car's rivals. On the whole, visibility is very good considering the car's sloping coupe body style. Um, out the front windscreen here, very generous, and you can pump yourself up quite high to get a good commanding view of what's ahead. The side pillars here are relatively thin, so they don't create too much of a blind spot at a junction or traffic lights. It's quite easy to see what's around you. And the mirrors are thin as well, but they're wide, easy to get a look at what's behind you. Also pretty impressed with the view out the back as well. You know, it's a lot better than you'll find in a lot of other coupe shaped models. But the major complaints I have here are the view out the back of my blind spot. So if I just turn my head like that, can't see too much out of that back window or that side as well. That's due to the thick side pillars obscuring your view. Though to make up for this, uh, LED headlights do come as standard. So this car is great for nighttime driving. Unfortunately, the infotainment is a little bit too fiddly to use while on the go. It's too far away for one. I have to stretch my arm out like that to just select the different options. It's also not angled towards the driver, so it means I have to kind of second glance over at the different options, taking my, my eyes away from the road there. The graphics though are fairly sharp. The icons are nice and large. It's a functional display, but if you love your tech, uh, say you love what you find inside the BMW Mini, you're gonna be disappointed with what's on offer here. But on the plus side, I like that the climate tr controls, they're not all integrated into this display. They're nice big buttons down here, really easy to press while traveling from A to B. When it comes to safety then, Kia has an excellent reputation in this regard and as a result you can choose most of the models in this lineup with a degree of confidence. The XC then is standard, you get traffic sign recognition, automatic emergency braking, lane keeping assist and with the top spec 4 variant you also get blind spot monitoring. This is integrated onto the wing mirrors alerting you of any cars passing close by. However, it is worth noting that when this car was last tested by Euro NCAP back in 2019, it was awarded four stars overall, and that is quite rare for a vehicle of this class. We're driving the facelift model now that is yet to be tested by the body. Um, however, it did score quite poorly in the occupant safety testing in the event of an accident, which means this car is less safe than some of its rivals, including the Mercedes A-Class and the Mazda 3. Worth bearing in mind if safety is important to you. I think it's about time we dive into this interior in a bit more detail, guys. Let's head back to our car park. The inside here is very familiar if you already own a regular seed or you've driven one before because it's pretty much identical. This is the entry level two specification here, guys, so don't expect an array of premium materials on offer. But there is a nice amount of um, material variety. I like the leather that's wrapped around the steering wheel here. It's nice and grippy. Good so use of soft touch materials on the dash. And I like the piano slash gloss black surrounds for that infotainment display. Very, very nice. Not a big fan of the cheap materials on the dash though. They also find their way on the doors here. But down here um, near the kind of window controls, we've got some nice soft touch material. So yeah, some decent variety. Just don't expect like a premium cabin you'd find inside a Mercedes, BMW or Audi model. It's not a stunner, but for the majority of family car owners and drivers, 
it's going to be absolutely fine. Legroom and headroom is pretty generous on par with the Volkswagen Golf and Ford Focus. Due to the sloping coupe roof line that we've got going on with the seat here, um, it kind of peaks just above the driver. So I'm 5'8", guys. As you can see, I have plenty of space to work with here. And if you're 6'4", over, this should not be an issue at all. You can also recline back really far exceptionally far a lot better than a lot of the cars in this segment actually so legroom is exceptional um, in terms of seat adjustment there's a great amount of adjustability to be had to find that perfect position for you i like to sit quite high up so using those manual levers i could pump myself up quite high there still going still going for some reason there we are that's the highest point now really good view of the road ahead and of course you can come down you can recline pretty much all the way if you want to, to get some shut eye and a motorway rest stop. Um, electric adjustment is reserved behind those higher spec grades, though if you opt for the four trim level, the top spec variant, you'll get driver memory seats and that means you can save your seating configuration to one of the profile buttons that will be positioned on the side here. So that's helpful if your partner or somebody else also drives the car and you don't want them messing around with your settings. There's a decent amount of adjustability with the driver's seat as well, so if you just pull that lever on the left hand side down, you can put it towards you and away, up and all the way down there if you want to do that so yeah pretty good and lumbar support adjustable lumbar support comes as standard with that two trim you hardly ever see that with a small suv model so that's great it's going to make those longer journeys a lot more comfortable in terms of the tech then behind the wheel of course we've got that traditional speedometer and rev counter but complementing this is a small 4.2 inch digital screen uh, during the driving section then you saw how we can have this display key information like fuel economy but there's a few other options available as well so let's just boot the car up and we'll show you what those are might even get to hear the starting jingle perhaps oh maybe not this time well you'll hear it eventually uh, so there we go then it's showing the fuel economy if you want to change uh, between the different options cycle between those just use the button on the right hand side of the wheel flick that up or down there's the accumulated info so that's how many miles we've covered in total in this car our average miles per gallon for the journey and how many hours we've covered in that journey then we've got other basic driving information and you could also have it show your speed if you prefer it to be shown digitally. With the top spec 4 trim and the plug-in hybrid variants, this display is upgraded to a larger 12.3 inch screen with digital instruments, though it is actually pretty pointless. Um, it's not much better than the standard display and I think this is all you'll need. One of my highlights of the interior here is the dashboard. It's simple, it's uncluttered, and the options, the buttons here are nice and large, easy to see while on the go. I just wish it was slightly more angled towards the driver, but that's my only major complaint. Um, the main attraction though is of course this eight inch color touchscreen. Uh, we're gonna boot the car up again. I probably shouldn't have turned the car off so we can see what that's like. So here we are, here's the display here. I talked about it a bit during the driving section. It's functional, it doesn't blow me away, but if you're somebody who just listens to the radio or likes to mirror your smartphone apps onto the display via Apple CarPlay or Android Auto to listen to an album or podcast, you'll be absolutely fine with it. So yeah, it's got Bluetooth, it's got DAB radio and Apple CarPlay Android Auto support, but it is wired with this particular entry-level trim. With the high spec grades, you can upgrade to a larger 10.25 inch color display, and this adds live weather, traffic reports, um, a three-way split for the options here on the menus. You can see we've got a two-way split here, as well as the availability of parking and pricing, which could be especially handy if you're driving somewhere new and you want to reduce the anxiety of that journey. So those could be some essential options for you. What is the lag like though for the screen? Well, let's dive into the menu. Actually, not too bad at all. It's quite responsive. Hardly any delays we swipe between those different options. Though the interface leaves something to be desired, doesn't it? It looks like kind of Windows XP here. It's a bit gray, it's a bit boring. No vibrant colors popping out, but at least the graphics are sharp and they're fairly clear. One thing that I am noticing though, as I talk about this right now, is I'm getting a bit of glare. It's not a particularly sunny day today. In fact, it's actually very miserable, um, but there's a bit of sunlight beaming through that back window. Um, I can see my hand showing up on the screen and there's a bit of light 
um, coming off there. So I can imagine on a particularly bright and intense summer's day, you're going to struggle to make out some of these options. As standard then, you get a seven speaker stereo system to complement the infotainment display. Sounds absolutely fine though. If you're an audiophile, you might wanna consider upgrading to that eight speaker JBL premium sound system that comes to standard with the four trim, but not the plug-in hybrid. I suspect that probably would have knocked off even more of the boot capacity, which is why I was excluded. But if you love listening to your music or podcast, this might be essential for you but it's not really an essential feature for the majority of drivers as that standard system is very good. Let's explore the dash in more detail. Just below the display, we've got those climate control functions, nice big buttons and big knobs as well. That's what we like to see. Just below that, then we've got a compartment where the wireless charging pad would be fitted if you opt for one of the high spec grades, but you don't get that with the entry level two trim, bit disappointing there. Below that is a USB port and a 12 volt socket or two on either side. I don't know why we got two but the more the merrier and then we've got a little compartment just below that that's perfect for the keys or other bits and bobs oh there's the little exit jingle as well just behind that compartment we've got our manual gearbox you can take a good look at that that's what it looks like and then we've got a couple of cup holders so we've just got a kind of tub of chewing gum in there that fits rather nicely does it fit my rather bulky bottle let's find out yes brilliant that's gonna stay in place rather nicely. Great stuff. And then we've got a rather cavernous center compartment there. Just lift that up. Goes down rather far, but there isn't any kind of USB ports in there, a 12 volt socket, none of that in there. Bit of a shame, would have been a nice addition. Moment of truth then, what is that glove box like? Let's get it open and find out. Actually, pretty good. I mean, as you can see, we've got our manual stuffed in there as well as a hat and an ice scraper and you could probably steal stuff some more things in there. You know, pretty good as glove boxes go then. The door bins though, different story, pretty claustrophobic and tight. They do fit my large bottle, but due to the way it's designed, it is rolling around quite a lot. So a better place for this would just be the cup holders in the uh, center console. But to make up for this, you do get a sunglasses holder, even with that standard two trim level. I haven't really spoken much about the seats because there isn't much to say. I mean, the design of these are a little bit boring and uninspired. Kia have never been exceptional in this regard. There isn't a range of upholstery options to choose from, unlike other brands out there. But if you opt for the top spec four trim, you can get black leather upholstery, which I guess makes the cabin a little bit more posh, but I'm fine with these personally. Okay, unfortunately, it's time to hop out now into that horrible weather so I can tell you a bit more about the rear and how comfortable that is for passengers. So if you're planning on having passengers six foot or over in the back here on a daily or quite a common basis, you're gonna to have to take into account that it can feel quite claustrophobic and even quite squishy in the back here. Let's start by examining legroom. So the seat in front, that is how I've configured my uh, driving position. As you can see, I haven't got too much legroom to work with. I can stretch my legs out probably halfway, not all of the way. And my knees are quite high up. It's like I'm sitting in an electric car right now, and that's already cre creating quite a bit of discomfort. Though there is a fair bit of back support provided by these seats, by this bit of material that struts out so that's quite nice um, that means it's going to be fairly comfortable for short journeys you know around town dropping the kids off at school um, doing the weekly grocery shop but for those longer journeys it will get quite uncomfortable unfortunately it's also worth bearing in mind if the driver is six foot or over they will probably be reclining further back than I would be in which case your knees may just be touching the lining of the seat though they should be nicely supported as the uh, the material here is pretty soft um, let's examine headroom next. So I'm 5A, I've got a little bit of space to work with. This is where the roof line does start to slope down towards the rear. So if you are six foot or over, the tufts of your hair might just be touching that. And if you have opted for the sunroof, that is gonna trim a couple more centimeters off that roof lining and it might make it a little bit uncomfortable for passengers over six foot as a result, despite letting lots of light in the cabin, which can feel quite dim and dark, especially on a winter's day like today. And if you've got three adults in the back, one there, one in the middle, you're probably gonna be sitting kind of up here, 
And as you can see, this is where, again, the roof lining starts to slope down towards the windows. And yeah, that's pretty depressing. On the bright side, the door does open fairly wide, as you can see, around 70 degrees there. So that's gonna make it convenient to load a bulky kid seat into the rear cabin space, which you can then attach to either of the Isofix fittings on both of the rear seats. And the covers for these are pretty resilient. They're spring loaded as well. So you're gonna be safe in the knowledge that that seat is gonna be carefully and securely strapped down. If you don't have someone sitting next to you and you want to rest your elbow somewhere, you can pull down this middle bit and then you've got a couple of cup holders there and a makeshift armrest. So it's not the most comfortable thing in the world due to that plastic, but it's a nice addition. That's kind of where it ends though with this entry level model. If you opt for the four or the four plug in hybrid variants, then you get 40, 20, 40 split folding seats. That means you can fold down that middle seat there and slide objects through into the cabin space. As standard, you get 60, 40 folding seats. So if you want to load a suitcase into the back, you can fold down those two seats there and create some extra room. Other bits to highlight, you get a pocket here behind the driver's seat and the front passenger seat, perfect for like a magazine or a laptop, other bits and bobs. The door bins are pretty disappointing. If I could just have my bottle, thank you very much. They doesn't, it doesn't quite fit in there, although I admit this is quite a bulky bottle, but I, I can't get that in there. Let's see if the cup holders will fit it. No, I mean, that's surprising considering it fit in the front. So I'm pretty stuffed when it comes to that bottle. I've got to put it down there. And there's nothing going on in this centre bit here where the compartment is. Normally you'd find independent controls for the climate. It's just a bit of plastic. I mean, they could have just stuck a charging port or, there, or something there just to spice it up a bit. But yeah, we've just got to stare at a big blob of plastic. That's going to be nice in the back. What about the middle seat then? What is that like? Well, let's slide on over. I mean, it's not great. But it's not that bad either, to be fair. That transmission tunnel is quite flat to the floor. It doesn't bulk out too much. Um, you're not going to feel like a jockey at the Grand National. But as you can see, my legs are encroaching on the personal space of those other rear passengers. And the plastic used for that middle seat is really digging into my back. So for short journeys, should be fine. But those longer journeys, yeah, it's going to get a little bit uncomfortable here. Let's touch upon the trim levels, guys. There's six available with the Exceed. The entry level model, that is the two variant that we've shown you today throughout this review. Prices start from £21,255. And my three highlights are the LED bifunctional headlights, this lovely eight inch colored touchscreen that we've kept the protective film on, and a reversing camera comes as standard. Next up, we have Connect. Prices start from £21,825. And on top of what I've just mentioned, here are my three highlights. A larger 10.5 inch navigation display, power adjustable lumbar support for the driver and front passenger seat. Oh, that's nice. And larger 18 inch alloy wheels. The free trim level is priced from £24,775 and the highlights here are dual zone automatic climate control, heated front seats and rear parking sensors. With the four trim level you get a panoramic sunroof, black leather upholstery and a smart power tailgate, all this and more for £29,080. Last up, we have the plug-in hybrid three and four variants. Spec-wise, they're pretty much identical to the regular three and four, and prices go up to £35,105. If you need a hand finding your perfect trim level, or you just want to explore options in more detail, call our team of experts on 01903 538 835, or just click the pop-up banner above. So guys, should you buy, lease or finance a Kia Exceed? Does it exceed my expectations? What are some things to really enjoy about this car? I love the strong looks. It's definitely one of the best looking cars in that very confused small SUV crossover segment that a lot of people love these days. And I love the new Kia badging. Great redesign there. Gives the car a lot of personality. As of course, you also benefit from Kia's class leading 100,000 mile seven year warranty. And that's the longest warranty currently available on any new car. Only Hyundai comes a close second with their warranty so it's a huge selling point for not just this car but the Kia range as a whole. The manual transmission takes a little bit of time to get used to but I'm really enjoying it. If you're not prepared to make that premium to go with automatic then this is going to be absolutely fine. Also really impressed with the generous amount of boot space on offer 
plenty of room for luggage, even an adult's bike if you take the wheel off, but just not with the plug-in hybrid variant. It knocks off far too much of that boot capacity. And this two variant right here, the entry-level model, is very well equipped. I'm very impressed. You get that eight-inch touchscreen in the cabin. You get that adjustable lumbar support standard as well. And that rear view camera can hardly say that comes as standard for a lot of brands and their entry level models. So Kia clearly prioritizing practicality and usability above all else here. And it works out really nicely for the Exceed. What don't I like then about the Exceed? Well, that rear space to begin with, it's pretty claustrophobic and squishy, especially if you try to fit three passengers, three adult passengers in the back. They're really not gonna like you for a longer journey. Safety wise as well, this car does pale in comparison to its rivals. And in terms of fuel economy, it's not as efficient as some of its competition. That may be important to you, especially considering that fuel prices are rising at the time of recording this video. Also, aside from practicality, does this car really do enough to separate it from the regular Seed? I think it's in quite a strange place in the Kia lineup. It's, you know, it slots between the Stonic and the Nero, but it's kind of a hatchback, it's kind of a small SUV. Where does it lie and does it really deserve to be in the lineup? Uh, I'd be interested to know your thoughts, guys. Would you pick this car over the Stonic or the Nero or the, even the regular Seed? What do you make of it? Let me know. Overall, guys, I've had a great time driving the Exceed. It's decently practical, it's pretty comfortable and stylish, and it could be your perfect next family car. If you want to explore the latest offers on the Exceed as well as other Kia models, head over to the O3 website and to chat through your options one-to-one -one with a vehicle expert, call our number on 01903 538 835 or you can just click that pop-up banner. Actually, it's that side just up there. If you enjoyed today's review, guys, you know what to do by now. Give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel for the latest in-depth vehicle reviews. And once you are subscribed, click that notification bell to get notified as soon as our new videos go live on the channel. But that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Safe driving.